Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are enjoying today's event so far. My name is Helen DuBoss, and I'm the publisher here at GovExec. It is my pleasure to introduce Megan Good, director of the Cyber Accelerator with Lidos, as well as Elizabeth Iwasawa, a quantum technology lead and research scientist with Lidos. These experts will discuss the extent and rise of quantum technologies their impact on how we defend and secure our data and systems, and our outlook on adopting this emerging technology. Take it away, Megan and Elizabeth. Hi, I'm Megan Good, the director of the Cyber Accelerator here at Lidos. And today I'm joined by Elizabeth Iwasawa to talk about the impact of quantum technologies on our cyber defense. Elizabeth, will you introduce yourself? Absolutely, thanks, Megan. Uh, my, as Megan mentioned, my name is Elizabeth and Technologies Lead at Lidos, and uh, I work with you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All good. We do work together a lot. And um, Elizabeth, I've always wondered, how did you get into this field of quantum technologies? So uh, I was actually dared to take quantum physics in college. I did an undergrad in something completely different, all humanities, and uh, took it as a first class and was blown away by it. Absolutely loved the field, got very interested, changed my whole plans, went to grad school, um, and then was excited to find out how relevant it is in industry for the government and for defense. Wonderful. And uh, for me, I think we've we do work together a lot because as we're starting really is the impact of these quantum technologies uh, for my role on our research and development that we're looking to do as we address the government's uh, largest challenges around cyber defense, uh, cyber operations in general, and then cybersecurity as well. Uh, you know, with these future environments that we're seeing coming more and more online, there are just different sorts of technologies than where we started when we start to think about some kind of classical computing technologies. And really for us, it's how do we get ahead of that? How do we start to think about what the security implications might be, what the resilience implications are for our environments and how we're adapting them over time to make sure that we're really addressing the kinds of threats that we're seeing created and ever more advanced. Um, so I thought this would be a great chance for us to talk about this as cyber defenders and learn a little bit more about quantum technologies. But Elizabeth, as, as we've talked about several times, I think there is a lot of hype around quantum technologies. I was hoping that you can start off by helping us demystify that a little bit. So what is quantum technology? You're right that there is a lot of hype. And uh, I suppose we can start with one of my biggest soapboxes, which is that there's <laughs> a lot more going on than quantum computing, though, especially for cyber, that's one of the main conversations that happen. So quantum technologies are basically any technology across all of physics or science that can be done with a quantum system, which is basically the small of the universe. As soon as you get down to really, really small physics, you get some very strange and unpredictable behavior, which we use to get very, very sensitive or very, very fast or very, very um, broad spectrum responses. And it's not as weird as it may sound when you first hear about it. And we use a lot of it every day, actually. So lasers, for example, are a quantum technology that you can buy off the shelf. And they're pretty much ubiquitous in just about everything from I'll show my age with DVD players to <laughs> laser pointers for torturing your cat. Hospitals use um, a, t a, a property called quantum spin to do MRIs and do that imaging. And that's, you know, a very resilient old technology. Uh, we like to say that quantum technologies are what make your phone run, although those semiconductors quite so small and working as part of the infrastructure. So it's not as out there as it seems, but quantum computing is one of the um, longer standing research fields that's pushing a lot of boundaries and changing how we look at computing in general. So uh, quantum computers use these tiny quantum states to do their computing. And they use two very cool principles called entanglement and superposition, uh, which allow them to do a certain set of calculations much faster. So instead of having a bit that goes from zero to one, you have a bit that can be any number in between zero and one all at the same time, which instead of having you know a million qubits to do that, you can do it all in one. And it can interact with the other bit faster. 
which helps solve a very specific subset of math problems, like factoring big numbers, which is what gets us back into encryption, oddly enough. And I think for me, when uh, learning about encryption as a computer scientist in the past, uh, it was always on those large primes. And it was the fact that all of our secrets rested on those secret keys, were the, which were these very large primes that nobody could ever factor. But if you can do a millions or millions of calculations, calculations within one bit and then there's you know just the scale there um it, it does get scary when you start to talk about how that factoring could happen really quickly and the way that we've been encrypting data the way that we've been encrypting traffic since about more than 90 percent of this work traffic is all encrypted um, and for that to be able to be read uh, externally i mean that really does put a lot of pressure on us as cyber defenders so the good news is we're not quite there yet, thankfully. Um, okay. And that not all, and you would know this. That would than be me. my next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, so my, my favorite term is the quantum cryptocalypse, uh, which is when quantum technology breaks all encryptions, which is uh, like any big fancy statement that's quite so broad, not true. So problems that are sort of like P problems and a few of the NP problems in mathematical space can be solved by quantum computers but definitely they don't speed up every type of calculation problem. So while we've been able to take advantage of the fact that it takes a long time to check every single set of some computers can speed that up, there are a lot of other cryptographic primitives that we use to encrypt our data, and those are actually safe from quantum computing. So it's kind of like, you know, submarines are really good underwater, but they would be miserable in a metro city center. <laughs> so it's, it's a very specific application set that quantum computers are better for. Um, and beyond that, uh, as I'm sure everyone keeps telling you, the um, cryptographically relevant quantum computer, which is something that can calculate all of those numbers at once, is still a ways away. So we're in the, not the dawn or the infancy, but that awkward toddling stage of quantum computing. We have computers, they're relatively um, well known by now. There's a bunch of different uh, care of them and uh, programming them, and there's many different styles that we're developing, but none of them have reached the number of bits, the compute power that we need to crack those numbers. So we're kind of in a race now to fix, <laughs> and well, not fix, but sort of make our encryption more robust before that becomes a threat. So you can see the threat on the horizon and we're moving against it. So like NIST came out recently with um, some new standards that are considered quantum resilient. And ensuring that you're prepared for that is some of the directions that we'll be taking. Right, it's that next step towards application mm -hmm. of actually selecting a standard um, as NIST does and then helping us move there. Uh, but you did say there's more beyond just what else counts as quantum technology. Yeah, and some of these actually also are threats to encryption as well in some fun and interesting ways. So. Um, we have quantum computing, which could possibly break encryption, but we have other cool systems. So quantum communications is another very advanced uh, field. And I bet a lot of you would potentially be surprised to know that uh, Metro City centers around the world actually have quantum communications networks installed alongside standard telecom networks that are up and running now. So there's one in Seoul, there's one in Cambridge, there's one in the Netherlands, in Delft. Um, and we're only just finishing one in uh, Chicago in the States, and there's one to be done in DC. And so it's, it sounds like communications, but you know, British Telecom is installing one as we speak. Um, and they're resilient enough. You know, quantum systems are, are powerful because they're so sensitive, but they're not so sensitive we can't already stick them in our cities. Uh, but the cool thing about this is um, the sensitivity of quantum um, bits of information is that they're very easy to be disturbed. So you And the way in which you disturb them cannot be hidden ever, because every single one of them has a pair that is linked in a very fundamental and special way to it if you use entanglement. And so you can't fake the signal, and if you disturb one of them, its pair will respond immediately, so you can't sort of eavesdrop either. So it's very resilient against jamming and eavesdropping. Spoofing, yes. right, where something is, it's not quite as it seems, but it, it looks legitimate. So interesting yes. that um, by adapting these quantum communications, that does help make us more resilient to that spoofing or to actually be able to detect eavesdropping, 
which for me would make me do something different from a threat hunting perspective to kick off a different sort of incident response kind of workflow. So um, pretty exciting of how that could be actually merged into applications. So quantum we, computing, quantum communications, mm -hmm. what else? Uh, we also have um, quantum sensing where we have, and this is actually the oldest field of quantum technologies and it's quite good, but we have sensors that are good enough to basically map space by how gravity itself, by just sensing these teeny tiny fluctuations in the gravitational fields or in these teeny tiny fluctuations in magnetic fields, which could say, let you navigate underwater without access to GPS, um, which is another quantum enabled technology <laughs> using atomic clocks on satellites. Uh, but these are sensitive enough that you could sense these microscopic changes in electric current on, say, a wire, which is another way of detecting a nefarious presence, to not use the cyber technology terms, and or ways, you know, we have magnetic readers that are sensitive enough that you could read off of an old magnetic disk, and I'm sure we still have data stored on some of these. Um, but when you couple that with something like the eavesdrop detection, you end up being able to get attacks, which I think are the store and decrypt attacks, where people are banking so much on having quantum computers that they're just downloading decrypted data they can't deal with yet. And you could start keeping track of what's getting taken. Right. And uh, I think what we've seen is the trends over the years is just so much data that has been um, stolen, uh, you know, exfiltrated, all these different data breaches. And you wonder if that's leading to this future of where you can actually decrypt anything that was encrypted in there. Um, I mean, I think on the other side of encryption, we see a, a whole rise of ransomware attacks and where um, the data is encrypted there. And maybe on, on the good side of these quantum computers can help us to make those attacks no longer something that's viable. Because, so, you know, you could see it both ways, but really interesting about how that plays into our cyber threat landscape that we're viewing today. And you bring up a good point that we can also use quantum technology to protect ourselves, <laughs> not beyond the eavesdrop yeah, detection, of course. but <laughs> quantum computing and other technologies are just as good as defending against um, some of these quantum threats. So there's uh, post-quantum cryptography, which is when we use sort of classical techniques like you're used to. Um, to protect against it. So something like fully homomorphic and encryption where you can actually do calculations on encrypted data. That's perfectly good and generally resilient against quantum computing. Uh, but there's also quantum cryptography, which is quantum technology enabled protection. Systems are alarmingly to some people relatively non-deterministic completely and they're very random. So you can make a perfect random number generator to encrypt things that can't be cracked. Um, so you'll know more about this than me, but I'm pretty sure most random number generators are inherently structured in some way <laughs> yes. that can be cracked. Now, I, I think with all of this, as we've been talking about it, the difference between classical and quantum, you know, we talked a bit about the speed um, that you can achieve. Uh, you know, what, what else are we expecting as kind of the benefits of the rise of all of these quantum technologies? Well, I mean, one of the things that uh, is, I think, heavy on everyone's mind uh, recently is the climate crisis and the amount of resources that we're using. And this may sound silly at first, because when you think of quantum computing, as it stands today, right, most well known are these ultra cold giant computers that are extremely resource hungry. Uh, but we're working more and more towards room temperature ones, and they might be smaller now, but there are actually several companies that have room temperature quantum computers and so now that we're evolving the technology and adapting it, it's actually much less power hungry to run at room temperature and then minimize and reduce the number of calculations you have. Or a lot of these sensors are actually very, um, what we call low swaps. So, so um, size, weight, and power, they tend to use and draw a lot less resources. So it's expensive in fields, but the end goal is systems that are very, very, very low power and very easy and quick to run. And as we wrap up, what are you most looking forward to with this? You know, when when is there the big impact of these quantum technologies? I mean, I would say that there's some that are being felt already with um, as you, as you've shown yeah. us. Yes, yes there's of course. government yes. networks already using quantum key distribution networks to send data back and forth. That's completely protected. Uh, you can even buy a Samsung phone with one of these quantum random number generators to protect your data. 
So we've already reached a level of new encryption and new communications methods. But um, one that I'm most excited about is secure direct quantum communications, where not just to alert us to eavesdroppers or encrypt, but to communicate directly because you can do so much more there. Or when we have full quantum computers or um, the quantum internet that we talk about. And the, the more I talk, the further the timeline gets. Yes. Right? So each of these examples is further out. Um, but it's very exciting to be at this edge where we're getting to the point where we're moving things from the lab and into the field. And definitely moving to practical application. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for the time and for sharing a bit more about the this range of quantum technologies and its impact on cyber defense. I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit more about that um, as we bring you, you know, an insight into what we're doing here at Lidos as we're making the world through science, engineering, and technology. Thank you. Thank you.